Welcome to Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective podcast, where we meet experts from all walks of life to learn their intrinsic motivation so that they can share it with the world. What do we have in store today? Stay tuned to find out more. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everybody out there in podcast land. This is Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. I am Hamza. And I am David. And I am happy to introduce someone from our own backyard. Uh, We have a relationship coach. We have a rock star relationship coach here in Atlanta, Georgia. He is a speaker. He's an author. He has a number of books out there, and if you go to his site, DarylFletcherSpeaks.com, he looks like a men deal if anyone watches Lucifer, so we have somewhat of a celebrity on the podcast as well. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Daryl Fletcher. Hey, 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 how's it going, man? Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you and also your listeners, so thank you very much. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm kind of on a high note for the, I don't know if you listened to some of our most recent podcasts, but I am originally from South Jersey, which is the Philadelphia suburbs. And Mm -hmm. so I've been waving the flag for the Eagles for a very long time and happy that they're going to have their parade tomorrow. And um, hopefully they won't have as many shenanigans as they did when the Eagles won the other night. <laughs> so. Wow, that that was quite quite that was quite a doozy, uh, to to say the least. And I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it was the 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 best approach, and I, I think there's probably going to be some themes throughout the podcast tonight. Um, a lot of if you had spoken with a lot of Eagles fans, you know, we've had a lot of heartache, right, for the past fifty plus years. And so it was kind of like, you know what, it would be great if we won, but we're just so happy to be here. And as a rock star coach, relationship coach, you may may or may not run into some of that. We'll, we'll uncover that as we move for, uh, forward. But I, I was just, just from the last thing about the Eagles, is somebody in the middle of all that chaos, he proposed to his girl, she said yes, and then they turned over 50 more cars, right? It was just like... <laughs> <laughs> Back to the debauchery. <laughs> yes. Love is in the air. It's February. We have a couple of more days, what, seven more days before our Hallmark holiday, and we have a relationship coach. So before we get started into uh, diving too deep into it, I'd like for you to talk a little bit about yourself and how you got into the realm of relationship management. Awesome. Uh, Well, once again, my name is Daryl Fletcher, relationship strategist and life coach. Uh, Essentially, I help frustrated couples improve the quality of their relationships and show uh, struggling singles how to make their next relationship their best relationship. And so with that, uh, I got into it because uh, most of my life I've been involved in uh, ministry. Most of my life I've been involved in some sort of capacity of serving others. And in 2010, I went through an ordeal in which uh, I went through a divorce myself. And so with going through a divorce and really beginning to understand that um, maybe I started out this thing wrong. Maybe, I, maybe, maybe what I thought I knew, I actually didn't know. And uh, in through, going through that, uh, got some coaching and some training and some, and some counseling myself, and one of the things that I realized was that uh, I realized that I had an issue with commitment and I had an issue with being vulnerable. And, of course, if you know anything about any type of relationship, whether it's a business relationship, whether it's a familiar relationship, whether it's a romantic relationship, vulnerability is one of those things that you really need in order for things to be successful. And so through that, I started journaling. And from journaling, that journal turned into a book called Disgustingly Beautiful, The Good, Bad, and Ugly of Couples. And essentially from there, I would have to say that my life changed. And the reason why my life changed is because I really began and I, over the course of the book, I had an opportunity to interview over 300 people 
and just get their perspective on relationships along with my study of human behavior and just the, you know, years of doing different things. And I really begin to understand that men and women want the same things, but we have a different way of communicating it. And so uh, as a relationship strategist, communication would have to be my central focus, which is actually – uh, which led me to my uh, next the the book out that I'll be releasing later on this year, which is called um, "Don't Just Talk, Connect," and how to have uh, successful personal and professional relationships through effective communication. So that's a little bit about me and what I do, because my goal is just to help people change their lives from from wherever they are to the next level. I appreciate that you had mentioned the divorce uh, back in 2010. I know there was some initial backlash for Steve Harvey, the comedian, when mm-hmm. he started writing his famous books about relationships, and they were like, well, you've been divorced. And he's like, yeah, because I've been divorced, I have a unique perspective on this. This isn't linear where we ride off to the sunset. We've got to take it yeah. day by day. Exactly. I mean, just well, in and, and that regard, many people would say, well, that makes you a hypocrite. And I would and I and I would challenge that statement because if we were walking down the, the the road and I fell into a ditch and then I climb out that ditch and then I stand next to that ditch and tell anyone that is going near or around that ditch, hey, don't step there, you don't want to you don't want to go there, that does not make me a hypocrite. That actually makes me a humanitarian. So through my successes, through my challenges, through my mistakes, through my bad decisions, I'm standing next to the whole of relationships and saying, hey, there's some different things that you can do in order to help your life be, uh, be a little bit different. Now, in the – let's just go back. I, w- I want to stay here for a second, if you don't mind. Sure. So for 2010, that was around the era of uh, – not even recovery. There were still a lot of people flailing due to economics, especially Mm -hmm. here in Atlanta. I mean, there was just unprecedented growth. We were actually one of the last cities to actually experience some type of of discovery or recovery, if you will. And Mm -hmm. did that contribute to uh, the divorce, your divorce? I, I would have to say yes. And interestingly enough that you would ask that, there is a chapter in my uh, upcoming book, uh, Don't Just Talk, Connect, um, where I actually talk about that, where I they wanted to – I was working for a large uh, retailer here. I was a manager in the in the retailer, retailing uh, sphere, and it was actually around 2008 uh, that this took place two, – I'm sorry, 2007, 2008 that this took, took, took place, in which uh, they wanted to cut my salary in half. And I was like, that's crazy. Um, you know, that's, that doesn't even make sense. And at that time, I had, I had a, a, a side uh, gig that I was doing where I created and made uh, custom suits and custom shirts uh, because I'm a tailor. And I figured, I said, you know what? I can, I can make my salary if I had 100% of my time um, dedicated to my business. And things were, things were going well. They started up very well. I traveled over around the country selling suits to different, uh, at different conferences and bankers and executives. And when, that, when the bottom fell out of everything, it affected my business tremendously. And so I talk about it in my book where the communication that I gave to my, my, my wife then, uh, it wasn't effective because all she heard was I was leaving my job. She didn't really have an opportunity to understand or she didn't even hear my why. And so for two years, she carried that resentment from her. And, 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 and in a heart-to-heart conversation, she just blurted that out. Well, you left your job for no reason. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You don't remember when I called you and I told you, you know, what I wanted to do? I didn't just pick up and leave my job. It was because you know, they cut my salary in half. And that was the motivational factor behind that because I figured, hey, you know, we could – we could make, you know, this type of money on our own. And so, and, that, and that's what we did. So the, the, the key to that was not taking or uh, allowing that financial impact impact us to a manner to where that I communicated selfishly. I communicated from a place of it was all about me and not considering, you know, her, her side of the perspective. So it's, it's important that, you know, whatever you may find yourself that, you know, you have to be able to communicate in a, such a manner where it connects with your audience and it connects 
with the, the, the person that you're speaking to because there's always four conversation going on. There's what was said, and then there was what was heard. And then there's what was meant, and then there was what was felt. So that pressure, that economic pressure that was put on my family during that time uh, could have been maneuvered a little bit better if I had effective communication. Mm. Daryl, why, why is it so hard for men and women to communicate in relationships just within your experience? Why would you say that? Uh, the, the reason why is because men and women are innately different. And because we are innately different, what we're going to do so, – so let's put it to you like this. One of the key elements of a good relationship is communication. That is bar none. You ask any expert of that, and they will tell you communication is important. But here is the challenge. Men and women speak different languages. So it's not about communicating. If we were on the line right now and you spoke Spanish and I spoke English, I could talk all day. You could talk all day. You could talk slow. You could talk fast. You could talk loud. But we're still speaking the same language. So the key in order to, for, a men, for men and women to really begin to, to, to thrive and grow is we have to get out of our selfish ways and learn another language. And so if I dropped you off right now in France, you would do everything you could to learn the language so you could survive. So when you, when you drop yourself into a relationship, it's both parties' responsibility to learn that person's language so that relationship can not only survive but also thrive. So communication is very important, and men and women do communicate differently. But here's the thing. We want the same things. We want to be loved. We want to be respected. We want to be supported. And when, when it's all said and done, that's the essence of the of the of the of the relationship, and so with that, it's just talk. It, it just it just takes a person the opportunity to learn that particular language of that particular partner that they have. Mm-hmm. Well said. Mm-hmm. Did you go to school here, Daryl? No, I did not. I actually grew up in uh, the Miami area. Well, I grew all I grew up all over, really. Uh, but I. I Two minutes before I got on the phone, before I got on the uh, call podcast with you guys, I was talking to my mother, and we were kind of reviewing, uh, you know, my matriculation through uh, elementary, junior high, high school, because we moved a lot of places. My father was a tremendous communicator and a great orator, and because of his ability to communicate and connect, he excelled uh, and rose through the ranks of an organization called Woolworth and Woolco Companies. And uh, he was a regional director. Now, the significance of that is because he was a black man in a company that was known for their racist practices. And he was able to maneuver through all that through effective communication and just excel. And so I was born in Williamsburg, Virginia. Then we moved to Florida. Then we moved to South Carolina. Then we moved back to Florida. Then I moved to Georgia. Then I moved to Maryland. Then I moved back to Georgia. So I've seen a lot and done a lot and had an opportunity to really connect with a variety of that types of people. And uh, I would say, I, I tell people all of this, I have not always had a, a lot of money, but I had a lot of relationships that I was able to leverage those relationships and, and travel the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's also good when you live in Atlanta to direct flight everywhere. So <laughs> exactly, exactly. I, I was listening to a guy the other day, and he said uh, he, he was basically saying, "Hey, I don't know if I'm going to heaven or hell, but it's a connecting flight in Atlanta." So yes, yes, indeed, <laughs> yes, indeed. And I do want to I want to stay at 2010 for one, for just a little bit longer because I I actually I went to college here. And so, okay. you know, for for not even I – and mean, I went to an HBCU, so we didn't just celebrate Black History Month. It was all year, you know. And yeah. so, what HBCU you know, was that? That was Clark Atlanta University. Awesome, man. That's where my wife went, and my son just got a scholarship offer from uh, from uh, the, the band to be in a band at Clark. Awesome, awesome. That is great news. Mm-hmm. Um, and my – I have a – I'm in the Big Brother, Big Sister program, so my little – He's at well, I won't I won't say it's high school, but he's in in town, and mm-hmm. um, he actually at Clark they had some uh, uh, economic issues with uh, this, their loan program, so 
they had last year, they, their band wasn't as robust as they used to be. And so mm-hmm. they reached out to his high school, and here I am thinking, like, yeah, I'm going to take my little to a to a game so you can see what the college life is like. And he's like, <laughs> he's touring with the university here around the country. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So so anyway, I, I wanted to bring that up because uh, Clark Atlanta because. Um, I, I, I graduated from undergrad in 96, and mm-hmm. at the time, we didn't know this man. He, he was, uh, you know, he was this exec from uh, Godfather's Pizza, and if you know, you probably know where I'm going with this, if, if you know who was the black exec from Hollywood, uh, Godfather's mm-hmm. Pizza, especially living in Miami, so you, you probably already know I, where I, I'm going with this. I, I know who you're referring to. All right, so... So anyway, Herman Cain. So <laughs> let's just go ahead and put it out there. <laughs> let's put it out. I mean, you know, we, 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 I, I loved it because I think this actually applies to um, where I'm going to go with this. So, so anyway, we were, you know, we're seniors. So you, you know, you're at that age where you can't tell anybody anything. And so he had, I think he had graduated from Morehouse, and his wife had graduated from Spelman. And he was like, man, I just love coming to the AEC and, you know, talking to these young cats. And I was there in, in, your, in your shoes, and I know you, you, you're not even listening to me right now because you think you have it all. You've done your little internship, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, I got to tell you, there is a tree around campus where we, I have my initials and my wife signed the initial too. So we were like, oh, that's cute, right? And he was like, at that tree, he told her, I am the type that likes to take risks. I like, you know, all these different things. If you want to marry a guy that's just going to stay at, you know, one company for his whole life, I'm not that guy. And like you said, because of that communication, his wife was with him, right? And so we were like, you know, he he had done everything. And this was way before he decided to become a Republican presidential candidate in 2012. But it kind of show it showed us, you know, this is the type. He, this is the guy. He takes calculated risk, right? I mean, to some people it may seem crazy, but to others maybe not as much. And so, one thing that we had asked him, we said, "Well, your wife rode with you because everything was successful, and you know she didn't really have any reason to complain." And he had said that, "No, you guys got it wrong. When I be when I took over Godfather's Pizza." I got paid like a pizza flipper. Like he had to go through each position and he got paid accordingly. And he was like, you know, for a long time, the marriage had gone a lot of ups and downs just because he wasn't getting what he was getting at his corporate job. He left the corporate job to start a franchise. And it sounds, I'm, I'm just bringing that up because it, it, I mean, hindsight's always twenty twenty. But in 2018, if, if there wasn't a downturn and there were some other extenuating factors, you think you'd still be married? You know, that is a very interesting question. And I, I, I don't know because, you know, my, my ex-wife and I, we still have a great relationship. We have four children together. And even this past uh, couple of weekends ago, um, we attended the um, – the the uh, battle of the bands together with our children because it's a it's a, it's a tradition and mm-hmm. my my cur- my current wife she uh she understands and she doesn't you know make any qualms about it uh so it, it's it, i would ha- i would have to say it would be hard to to even answer that question it's that is i've never even fathomed it or thought about it but because we had some we had some other issues as well and communication was one of them. You know, I'm a communicator. I like to talk. My ex-wife, she was not. She was not the person that, you know, wanted to hash it out or talk it out. She just wanted to let it fester, and, and that, would, that would challenge us. So um, looking at that, I honestly don't I'm, – I'm, I'm not a person that is lost for words, but for that one, I honestly don't have an answer. I really don't. Mm. I can't even, I can't even, you, you stumped me on that one and that's hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You really stumped me on that one. It's, it's interesting because uh, David and I, we had some alternative uh, upbringing, if you will. And, and so, you know, we, we follow a lot of traditional stuff, but we also follow uh, let's just say we're open to different schools of thought. And mm-hmm. so there is a school of thought that 
there are no accidents. And mm-hmm. because you had gone through that initial relationship, that made you an even better candidate, if you will, for your current wife. Yeah, and, and I, w- I would have to agree with that one. Um, I would not be the man I was or, or the man I am had I not gone through some of the things that I did. Uh, mm-hmm. I made a lot of bad choices. I made a lot of selfish choices in my first marriage. However, everything after that created me or, or made me who the man I am today. Uh, so I would have to say, you know, it's kind of, it's almost like a catch-22. You know, you don't, you're like, man, uh, the, 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 the experiences that I went through, they were challenging, but, man, they, they, they made me. And it's like, you know, if you think about a diamond, you know, and, and, and coal, but, you know, all that pressure that it has to be under in order to make that diamond. And then so does the diamond say, hey, you know, I look beautiful and sparkly now. Do, do, do I, do I, sh- should I regret going into the fire? You know, and, and so with me, I don't regret going into the fire because I've, I've had an opportunity to come out and be sparkly. Would have, mm-hmm. what, you know, from a perspective of would I have liked my family to stay together? That answer would be 100% yes. However, I don't know where I would be if I did not go through the experiences that I did because it, 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 it was a catalyst for me to mature. It was a catalyst for me to uh, change a perspective, my, change my perspective on, on women, change my perspective on even myself. So, you know, if, if I could have learned those lessons and stayed married, then, then yes. But if I would lose the lesson, then I would have to go ahead and make that exchange because mm-hmm. I, I believe the lessons were, were, were and are felt far valuable uh, in my life and to make me the man that I am today. Mm-hmm. Well, Daryl, how, how important was it you to, to understand, uh, you know, another person's dynamic or maybe specifically your ex-wife in a relationship? It, it, it's 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 very important because I tell people all the time, you'll never hear me throw my ex-wife under the bus. I take full ownership and full responsibility of every bad decision, every bad choice, every moment of being selfish that contributed towards the demise of my marriage. And so looking at her, and I know she's gone through some things and, you know, uh, you know, it wasn't really my, it wasn't my choice to, to get, 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 get divorced. But I look at her and I see the importance of being, looking at yourself in the mirror. Being able to look at yourself in the mirror, whether it's in a professional space or a personal space, it speaks volumes. And until we take that walk, until we take that walk to say, you know what, I need to take full ownership of whatever someone did to me. Because uh, Will Smith put out a video a couple of weeks ago, and he talked about fault versus responsibility. And, you know, it may be somebody's fault of what they did to you, but it's still your responsibility to not allow what they did to you affect you in such a manner that you can't can't function or that you, you just be in a butthole. So, you know, when it's all said and done, you still have the responsibility of building your character. You still have the responsibility of building your vocabulary. You still have the responsibility of, 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 of being a quality human being. We can't take the back, the, 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 the back seat and say, well, this happened to me when I was six, and this happened to me when I was nine, and, and, and that's the reason why I am. Okay, that's the reason why you are. But it's still your responsibility to be what you want to be. So until you do that, you will always get what you've always gotten. And when you always get what you've always gotten, you 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 will stay stuck right where you are. So if you want to improve the quality of your life, I say it starts with the quality of your communication. And that first level of communication is yourself. How are you communicating with yourself? Uh, uh, one of t- Tony Robbins said this uh, a couple of, uh, well, not, I don't know when he said it, but, you know, I, I was listening to some information. And he said, everything in life has no definition until you put the definition on it. 
So how will, how, will, how will those challenges define you? How will those things that happen to you that, think, that you thought were detrimental define you? Because so many people respond to different things differently. And so here it is, you have one person that, that was, 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 was molested during childhood, and so they went to a life of promiscuity. But then you have a, another person that went into that had the same type of situation, but they went into a life of being thriving and making sure that that doesn't happen to another person. So they had the same experience, but they chose to define the experience differently. One used it as an excuse to to go down a different path, but one used it as a reason to make sure that that doesn't happen to another individual. So here we are as human beings, we have an opportunity to really shape and mold our lives based on how we define or how we choose to to define what happens to us. Because you can't control what happens to you, but what you can control is the response that you have. Yes, completely agree. What about those that struggle with, you know, emotional attachments? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, well, let's take a look at emotional attachments. You know, most emotional attachments, when we, when, when we really fundamentally break down emotions, emotions are indicators. They are not dictators. Emotions are simply indicators, not dictators. So what does that mean? If I step on your foot, you feel it. So, you know, we'll say that it represents our emotions, a, a feeling. And so when we, emotions, we, 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 I, would def, I would define it this way. Emotions are an, either, are an indication that something has happened or something needs to happen. So if someone does something to you and it, it affects you emotionally, and typically it, it comes from a place of hurt, then that hurt only really derives from a sense of loss. You may have sensed that you may have lost something. And so that is an indication that something needs to happen in order for you to be healed. Because if you take the time to just say, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to bow out of life. I'm just going to allow what happened to me when I was young affect me for the rest of my life. Or you can make the decision to say, you know what, I don't know how to change, but I want to get some help to change. So nothing has any meaning except the meaning that we give it. And if, when we make the choice and, and, and say, you know what, I'm going to look at this thing a little bit differently. And so it may be some emotional atta- attachment there, but I'm going to allow that emotional attachment to be an indication of something for me to do something in order to get out of this particular situation. Mm. Oh. I'd like to talk about a guilty pleasure of mine, and sure. I have to I have to qualify that first. So I have to <laughs> my qual- <laughs> right. Let me put an asterisk by there. So the qualification has to be, uh, and there's been uh, studies that the the numbers that there are numbers to back this up. So uh, in the 80s, which you know that was my era before era before going to school, going to college. And what influenced my decision was, uh, or a lot of it, was, you know, the Cosby show and the movies that had come out around that time. Uh, they, there was a huge push for HBCUs, right? At the time, mm-hmm. I wasn't really thinking about it. My girlfriend and I, at the time, we were both going to go to university because uh, I finished high school in, in Orlando. So we were both looking at Gatorland and, and all that. But uh, with the – with Cosby Show in a different world, there was just this huge push of African Americans from eight, I think the stats are from 88 to 96, there was a 40% bump in a, enrollment at HBCUs, right? Mm-hmm. So, okay, so fast forward, uh, fast forward to the 20 teens, and you have this TV show called Blackish, and, you know, people are mm-hmm. watching that and, and what have you, and then they have their spinoff, which is uh, Grownish. And mm-hmm. so I, I was just so happy because I was like, wow, this is going to get – because the numbers of people going to get a, a, a degree has dwindled over the past decade. Past decade. And so I was like, wow, there's going to be more interest in going to college and, and everything that that, that that brings. So that brings my guilty pleasure. So as a guy, I, I was watching Grownish because it's really like a girl show. Why are you watching it? But the trigger that I have to bring up is – 
she's on campus and she you know she's she's kind of playing the field you know she, she just got there and so she's trying to date these two guys and they both found out and you know she's mm-hmm. busted right so she's walking with her girls and they're like you know it'll be all right and and then she runs into this next guy and that that's why i'm saying guilty pleasure because that was a trigger for me because when i was in school for guys it was oh my god i want to say like for every 20 girls there was one guy right and so it was like oh man i remember the college days i'm bringing that up because you had initially talked about issues with commitment and issues with being vulnerable and we just had our our 20-year reunion last year and it was really interesting everyone that graduated and stayed here they were still single like they did the whole corporate route which is myself and and others and everyone else that moved away got married families and all that and it was just really interesting and, and i so it was a trigger when you said issue with commitment because in that hbcu environment or the college environment you have uh, women that kind of have their pick of the litter and then when they get older they're they're in their corporate lives and what have you so that issue of commitment isn't really there because they they have a lot of other needs being met i wanted to get your take especially um we have like five clusters in the country we have atlanta in my opinion atlanta chicago new york la and maybe miami where you have like this huge black middle class but they're not really settling down and i wanted to get your take on talking about you're talking about communication but I wanted you to talk about commitment as well yeah uh, commitment see you, you can't practice what you you can't perform what you haven't practiced and so let's 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 back up you know with with from from away from college and just let's say the average uh, I did a study years ago I was a youth pastor and um, the average person starts dating around 15 um, or you know, entertaining entertaining the opposite sex around 15. So, and then uh, further in my study, I found out that the average relationship at that age lasts three to six months. So, that then tells us that okay, if you're average, um, you're entertaining two, maybe even three people. A year so let's so so let's do some math so if I let's say from 15 to 25 I keep that pattern up that creates around let's say 20 people that I have basically entertained dated in my life never committed to them because anytime a problem would would occur the first thing we do is we break up and so if i continue that cycle and let's say i'm 25 and now i'm 25 i meet this person that i really like i'm really into them i really just like they are the person that i've been waiting for all my life for the past 10 years i haven't practiced any commitment I practice dating. I practice liking people. I practice a whole bunch of stuff, but I haven't practiced commitment. And what you do the most is what you do the best. And so what I do the best is getting in and out of relationships. So commitment, I don't even know what commitment is. I don't even know how to commit, but I want to because I've been told that's what I'm supposed to do. And so if I continue that mindset, and, 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 and let's address the fact of what you said, let's talk about that person who ha- that, 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 that is uh, upper middle class or you know, up, has an upward mobility of, of their, of their, of their uh, social status or economic status. And so the, for the last past 10 years or whatever the case may be, I've been focused on my career. And being focused on my career didn't give me the opportunity to really entertain anybody or really be committed to anybody. I've been committed to my education so I can stack my chips and so I can get the the latest bands or BMW or whatever 
and now it time here come time that my biological clock is ticking or I wanna I wanna go ahead and, you know, be involved within a, a committed relationship, but I don't know how. I don't know how because I've never had to. No one ever put the demand on me, and because no one put ever the demand, and I'm not saying that that's something that we should do with people young or, you know, put a demand on them. Maybe we should just, you know, kind of tailor them back from starting so early. And I'll, and I'll tell you something else that was interesting in my study during that time. A person between the 15 and 17, the average relationships last three to six months. If that person waits till 18 to start dating, that, that, that average goes from a year to a two years now. And we, and we just simply talk about the numbers because I made this, I made this, uh, uh, I told this on a different podcast one time. And so the guy was like, you mean to tell me I'm supposed to tell my daughter wait, to wait till she's 18 to start dating? <laughs> and, and, and I said, no, I'm just giving you the numbers and the statistics. You can do what you want to do with them. And, mm-hmm. you know, my wife, not my wife, but my, my oldest daughter is 21 years old. Mm-hmm. And uh, she didn't casually date. She wasn't in and out of relationships, you know, with people, you know, during that time. Did did I allow her to talk to men? Yes, I did, because as 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 a father, and during that time I was actually dating. I hated to talk to women that um, couldn't hold a conversation. So mm-hmm. I wanted to have that ability to just at least have a conversation with the man and maybe hold his interest or really begin the understanding. But I was not going to allow her to get in these, these fly by night relationships and condition her conditioning her for being in and out of relationships. So my daughter right now is, has been in a relationship. Uh, She's 21 and she has been in a three year relationship with this one. Is it three years or two years, two or two and a half year or three years relationship. I attribute that to, number one, having an open line of communication with my daughter. I always tell my children, we can always fix the truth, but a lie we can't do anything with. And so it's important that we don't lie and hide and, you know, do all those different things that, 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 are, that, are, that, are, uh, that are challenging to us, that present a challenge in our relationships, and whether, whether that's, you know, whether you're a father or a parent or, 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 or a child, whatever it is, it's always important to keep those lines of communications open. And so one of the reasons why people don't keep those lines of communications open is judgment. They're free, they are afraid of what somebody's going to judge them about. And so I talk about that in my book, talking about creating a non-judgment zone. But getting back to the, 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 the fact of, you know, this commitment thing, it's important that we see that commitment is not something that you just say, okay, I want to do it. You have to practice it. My, I, I, my current wife, I met her online, and at that time, I was talking to maybe six other women online, but I really liked my wife, and I called her, and I said, listen, and I let her know, you know, hey, I'm talking to a whole bunch of other chicks online, and it's cool, and she was like, okay, it's cool. I'm talking to other people too, and so, but because I started really beginning to like my wife, I called her, and I said, listen, I know I have commitment issues. But what I would like to do is I understand that I can't perform commitment if I haven't even practiced it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop talking to these other chicks, and I want to solely focus on you. I want to solely focus on you and give, you the, and, and give us the opportunity to grow and expand. Was that challenging for me? Yes, it was. Coming from my background and being a single man, like you said, the ratio sometime in Atlanta is 20 to 1. And so you get the big head, he be like, oh, man, shoot, I can juggle this one, have this one on Wednesday and this one on Thursday. You know, all this type of foolishness that we sometimes try to convince and deceive ourselves about. But the one thing I was sure about is how, what I wanted. So I started putting my energy into what I wanted rather than what I, what I would settle for. Mm-hmm. So with the, with the women who have chosen their careers before their social, their, 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 you know, getting married and all that type of stuff, there's some consequences to that. And, and am I saying that, you know, hey, you should get hitched up with a guy? No, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is you build up such a level of independence to where you don't, in, you don't even know where a man fits in your life. And so if I know anything about both men and women, on both sides of the spectrum, 
neither a man or a woman want to be an option. They want to be a priority. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah, that's kind of, we're not ending, but that was like an excellent way to end the podcast. <laughs> that was huge. Well, this is not, I guess we'll we'll dig in a little bit. So um, with that 15 to 25, it's such a, I mean, it's, it, okay, so, it, and I don't have kids. So, you know, my little, I'm not ha- hanging my hat on him, right? He's 15. So, what? Oh, I'd be so heartbroken, right? If he came and was like, yo, I got, you know what I'm saying? This girl's pregnant, you know what I mean? Like, from that 15 to 25, like, you don't even know who you are yet. And so, you yeah, have... but we, we, yeah, you, t- t- men and women are not going anywhere. They're not. They are not. And we could just take some time. To, to just relax. You know, that's the time you should be focusing on your education. That's the time you should be focusing on, you know, learning extracurricular activities, playing, in, playing a sport, being in a band, something. You know, you got all this energy. Focus, on, focus, that, focus your energy on that, you know, um, because it's, it's, it's just, it, you're just setting yourself up for an emotional roller coaster that will be never ending. Find yourself. Find, identify with who, communicate with who you are first before you start trying to connect with other people. Yeah. Because you'll get on that roller coaster and then by the time you're 35, you'll look back up at, at, at your body count and you'll be like, man, I should have slowed down a little bit. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But you, you, but but you say that because you you developed a thirst and a hunger for it early, and didn't know how to satisfy that thirst through any other means. So now, the only fix is the next fix, and that fix don't do nothing for you. It's I mean. It's, it's almost like a drug, you know. I, I, you, you, you talk to any drug addict, and they'll tell you. They'll say, hey, man, that first high was the best high, and you spend the rest of your life trying to get back to that first high. Yeah, chasing that one, yeah. So here it is. We have that same experience through lust. That that first experience was, wow, that was, that was great, or that was, a, that, was, that was all right. But then you just spend the rest of your life looking for that someone to fill that void or someone to feel that make you feel the way that person felt. So being a whole individual in a relationship is the key. You know, you can't be I work with men men and women preparing them, you know, for, you know, relationships. And you can't go into a relationship saying, man, I just want this person to complete me. Nobody can complete you. If you're not complete when you get together or when you meet someone or you're on your way to being complete, you will blame. You will blame. Put it like this. If you get into a relationship empty, you will blame the other person for not filling you up. Yeah. Exactly right. <laughs> I've always told Dina, you know, I've always held myself responsible for my happiness within a relationship. That's just me mm-hmm. personally. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I tell my wife, I say, you don't make me happy. You add to my happiness. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when it kind of comes down to it, Daryl, and I, I say this because uh, there's this uh, radio station I listen to on occasion, and the guy there, he's always, pre- they're always talking, they have like a relationship the relationship segment, and he always talks about, you know, relationships, when it comes down to it, are for mature people, mature adults. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, relationships are not for the faint at heart <laughs> and for the weak. Uh, my wife says it this way, you can't love, lead, or live scared. Yeah. But that's the way many people do it. Yeah. 
God bless the dead. It, it makes me think of, of Dr. Kress Welsing. She, you know, she, I mean, we had the whole gamut that kind of came through. And so I'm a little spoiled in, in that we had the black intelligentsia, you know, you got so many different schools of thought. And I just remember at the time we were in that 15 to 25 year, right, that we were of our age. And she was, and she had introduced the concept of not even getting married until you're 28. Right. Mm-hmm. And she's like, cause you don't know yourself until you're at least 28, you're going to go, the twenties are full of so much change. And yeah. so, you know, what, what's your take on, because there are not just our community, I mean, across the board, people are get are waiting later and later to get married. So what, what's your take on that? I'm an advocate of it. I'm an advocate of people waiting till they know that they're mature enough to handle because marriage will expose who you are at your core. You're living with somebody, you know, day in, day out, and they have an opportunity to really see who you are, not the, not the, the, the facade that you want everybody to believe who you are. One of the most beautiful things that my wife ever said to me was, I, was, I came in the room and I was a little frustrated about some things from, from a financial perspective. This is, this is my current wife. And I was disappointed in myself because I was supposed to, you know, do this deal and the deal didn't work out. And I was a little bit disappointed in myself. And I I had to come in and tell her, you know, how things were going. And she was ironing clothes in our closet. And I expressed to her my disappointment and what was really going on. And you know what she said to me? She said, Daryl, I knew who you were when I marry you. That was the most beautiful thing that she could have ever said to me. Because what that told me is that she knew about the ups. She knew about the downs. She knew about my strong points. She knew about my weak points. She knew about everything about me, everything that she knew about me, and she still made the choice to say yes. And because she made the choice to say yes, she knew what she was signing up for. And one of the number one causes of of divorce today is unmet expectations. People have these expectations that this person is supposed to save them or supposed to make them feel like this or make them do like this, or I thought you was going to do it like that. But the, the, the distance between their expectation and reality is called frustration. And so here we are, and we want these things, and we, we, we have a, a mindset for these things, but if we don't manage our expectation and discipline our disappointments, we will walk through life pointing the finger and always being the victim. That's huge. That's very huge. Yeah. It, it, it makes me think of this last, you know, we're, we're coming out of, I mean, we've had some pretty good years after, you know, the last uh, couple of years economically here in Atlanta and, and across the nation. But uh, prior to, let's just say, 2014, the divorce rate had uh, increased because there were so many changes. And you had, Mm -hmm. you know, you had a two, let's say a two income household and one one partner lost their position. And then they found a position maybe three states away and they wind up taking it. It was just really, it was was really interesting of... um, I don't know if decisions are made more so on survival or like you said, unmet expectations is just like, Hey, you know what? This was great, but it's not working anymore or it's not smooth. And I think Mm -hmm. most people are that unmet expectations is that they're not going to be any rocky roads through the relationship. Yeah. And another interesting thing that took place during that time through our economic downfall, people were divorcing, but staying together. Mm-hmm. Like they would, yeah. they would, they would get actual, they would actually get a divorce. But you know what? I can't afford to live on my own, so yeah. we just got to, we just got to toughen this thing out. I don't like you. There go your room over there. But economically, <laughs> this, this, this is, this, this is what we want to do. <laughs> and uh, I say, I say to people who, who, who think like that, man, if y'all can stay in the same house and not kill each other, then y'all can work that thing out. And, and right. that's, 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 that's my perspective on it. Uh, you know, you. You, you, if you can, if you can tolerate someone enough to say, okay, we're gonna live in the same house together. I ain't gonna touch you. You ain't gonna touch me. But you know, we just or we doing this, you know, forever. Man, go ahead and and invest in a coach, 
and a counselor and a therapist and give your relationship the gift of a better you. Because most relationship issues are not relationship issues. They're individual issues that have manifested in the relationship. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good point, Daryl. Sorry about that, David. Go ahead. I was going to ask, how important is it for like, couples to be present within a relationship? And what I mean by is, you know, present time as in to not, you know, holding on to stuff in the past and or like grudges, for example. How does that affect mm-hmm. relationships? It, 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 affects, it affects relationships tremendously because those grudges become our filter of how we talk and how, how we talk, how we feel, and how we try to connect with that particular person or our behavior with that particular person. So if you are not – just think about it. Every time you change your oil, you get a filter. You, you, they change a filter. And, you know, think about it, how people date. I can remember for a time in my life, if, if I broke up with you on Friday, guess what? I had a new chick by Monday. I never changed my filter. I, I was, I was, so I was treating Beth the same way I was treating Keisha and treating them all the same, telling them the same lies, never changing my filter, living in the past, trying to create something new. And if you're in a present relationship and you're holding on to stuff from 1999 that they did, then you are doing that relationship a disservice. And one of the reasons why you're doing that relationship a disservice is because think of it this way. When you're driving in the car, you have a windshield that gives you a maximum view of what's ahead of you. But if you only look in your rear view mirror, you will end up hitting everything and running everything over. Why? Because you're so focused on what's behind you that your future is, is going to be damaged on what you haven't let go of your past. So the, the key element to that is, once again, I've got to heal. I, I tell men a lot sometimes when, when I'm dealing with men and, and couples, they say, well, she keep on bringing up this from the past. And I'm going to t- I tell you this, the reason why she keep bringing it up from the past is one or two reasons. Number one, she hasn't healed from it. And number two, you haven't shown that your behavior has been adjusted. So if the behavior hasn't been adjusted, it keeps reminding her. So let's say a um, guy has a problem with gambling, and he gambles the house away, or he gambles a mortgage payment away. Let's say just he gambles a mortgage payment away. She forgives you. You stop gambling for a little while. Then your gambling habit comes back up. And then she keeps bringing it back up. And then she'll say something like, well, you remember when you gambled the rent money, and you're like, man, that was two years ago. Well, guess what? You're exhibiting the same behavior that put you in, 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 in this space two years ago. So you can't heal from something. A wound can't heal if somebody's still poking at it. So if, if, if we are going to he- actually heal, we've got to take those necessary steps to, number one, whatever happened in the past, leave it there. And, and in order to really go through that healing process we can't be we have to confront it we have to be honest we have to you know just really let it all out on the table and say guess what all right i'm moving on i'm 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 letting this go now it just doesn't happen overnight but you have to be committed to the process of letting that thing go because if you're not committed to the process then it will once again haunt you over and over Uh, you you brought up emotions uh, earlier once again feelings are indicators not dictators so you're allowing that thought from six years ago, seven years ago, ten years ago to haunt you and attach it to a feeling in the present moment and make you feel a certain way about it. You can't go forward like that. That's like trying to run, run with shackles on your feet. you got to break the shackles. First, mm-hmm. we have to break it mentally. When we break it mentally, you, you can't uh, – I tell people this. You can't fight um, mentally 
You can't, mental cannot fight with mental. You can't take one thought and try to overcome another thought. That, that just does not work. Biologically, it doesn't work like that. The only way you're going to overcome a thought is through resetting that thought through the words that you speak. Let me give you important case. So if you, you, you can't count to one in your head and speak the alphabet. Your brain doesn't work like that. Your brain works in alignment. So your subconscious mind is where all your memories are stored. But your conscious mind is what assigns the feeling to those memories. So here it is. You now have to verbally speak something different that's in your conscious mind to those memories that's in your subconscious mind in order to get a different result or a different feeling. So you have to be able to recondition yourself, reset yourself in order to experience something different from what you experienced in the past. Does that make sense? No, it makes total sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So, so it's important that when we look at someone that is dealing with some struggles from the past is, number one, we have to redefine what that, what that, what that experience was. If you look at it, somebody hurt you, then, then science would tell us that you're looking at, looking at it as a loss rather than assigning the label of that wasn't a loss, that was a lesson. See, I tell people all the time, I don't, they say you win some, you lose some. I don't say that. I say you win some and you learn some. Because as long as I learn something, guess what? I never lose. So whether it's in a relationship and I did something or made a bad choice, oh, I've got to learn from that. Take a look at my marriage, my, my, my previous marriage. Did I lose something? Somebody, some, some people may say may I did, but I learned a valuable lesson. And I believe that the lesson that I've learned is much more valuable than what people can say that I lost. Mm. So let me ask you when, because uh, we're, we're, we're going with this, through this with my little right now, right? So we're looking at different schools. We're looking at scholarships, grants, all the, all the fun stuff you do with high school kids, right? Because you're, mm-hmm. you're looking to prepare for his future. And then afterwards, you're looking at, you know, setting up uh, so financial instruments so he can be financially set. And what we've been talking about has been a lot of reaction which I'm sure that's when people would come to you, which makes the most sense. But, and I think a lot of it could be potentially because they, there's an argument of, hey, I, I didn't know what I didn't know. So what, what are some ways that can be proactive but also be indicators that they should speak with you? Well, if you, if you, if you take a look at your life, you, you want to pay attention that there is some – writing on the wall and just paying attention to writing on the wall and different patterns, you just really have to ask yourself, you know, from a financial perspective, from a relationships perspective, what are some of the patterns that have been happening in my life? What, are, what, what, what have I seen that could, you know, could possibly be a red flag? You know, I, I tell, I tell, I tell people all the time, that maintenance is always cheaper than repair. So there, three times in my life I've had to replace an engine in the car. And the first engine cost me $1,500. The second engine cost me $3,000. And the last engine was so expensive that I couldn't, even, I couldn't even afford to change it. But all those engines could have been saved through an oil change. And oil, uh, oil change is 35 to $75, depending on the brand and type of car you have. And so what we do is we get in repair mode so frequently. We have to condition ourselves to get maintenance mode. Maintenance mode for your finances. Maintenance mode for your, for, for your relationships. Maintenance mode for your job. Maintenance mode for your future. Whatever it is, we, if we condition ourselves to be in maintenance mode, 
convincing ourselves to say, you know what, I'm going to uh, try to maintain this thing. So what does that look like financially? Well, let's, let's start with what your goals are. What are your goals? What do you actually want to do? Financially, from a financial perspective, what, is your, what do you want your life to look like? What, okay, now that you know what you want your life to look like, what is that going to take for, you to, for that to happen? What type of life, what, you know, how much income do you need to do that? Do you need $10,000 a month, $5,000 a month, $20,000 a month in order to live your life? So then we back, uh, backtrack on what I call reverse engineering. We start with the end in mind and then work our way backwards and really begin to understand, okay, if I want to have this type of life, this type of life, this type of car, live this way, uh, go to this college, whatever it is, that's going to take me $30,000 a month. What in the world, what job could I do for $30,000? You know? So, okay, well, then let me scale my back, life, life back a little bit. Okay, maybe I won't live in this neighborhood. Maybe I won't do this, you know, whatever. That's going to take me five, ten thousand dollars, whatever it is. Whatever your life, the life you want to live, whether it be in finances or relationship, you can reverse engineer it and say, okay, these are the things that I have to do in order to live up to this goal, in order to live up to this standard. And then you start putting the things in place in order to support that. You, you, if you, if you take that, the look at a, a, a car being manufactured, and then just break it down and move all the different parts, you're like, man, there's a lot of different parts that I got to that I gotta do. So start focusing on those parts. When a plane crashes, when there's a plane crash, they gather up every part to reconstruct that plane so they can know what happened and how it happened because they're reverse engineering the sequence in their, in their head so they can, you know, put all the pieces together. So whether it's in your relationship, whether it's in your finances, whether it's, in, whether it's in your family structure, start with the end in mind and then reverse back and really begin it so you can paint a picture, okay, I need some screws, I need some nuts, I need some plywood, I need some, I need some, I need some glue, I need all these different things so you can put that thing together and at the end you'll get what you want. Mm-hmm. So we we are at the top of the hour. So what you just mentioned, if if I want to re-engineer with relationships, how would I get in touch with you? And, and what are your social media so people can get in touch with you and buy your disgustingly beautiful and sit on their hands so they can get your don't just talk connect book. Well, you can follow me on social media. All the same, uh, Daryl Fletcher speaks. That's D A R Y L. F L E T C H E R speaks S P E A K S. That's Instagram, Twitter, my website, uh, Facebook. Uh, we also have a uh, social media uh, uh, love logistics that focuses on the relationship side of what we do. Love logistics circle, and that's love logistics circle.com on Instagram, Facebook, uh, giving you some good quality tools and resources and information on how you can take your your relationship to the next level. Uh, so you can follow me there. And uh, on all, like, on, like I said, on all social media platforms, I would love to connect with you. If you have a question, comment, or concern, I would love to see if we can connect and help you uh, just give the gift of a better you to all your relationships. Fantastic. Uh, you've just been in tune to another fantastic podcast with intrinsic motivation from a homie's perspective. This is Hamza. And I am David. And, Daryl, it was a pleasure, man. Let's stay in touch, and we'll follow up with you as our journeys connect again. Yeah, thank awesome, you. man. Man, I appreciate the time, and thank you so much for having me. You're so welcome. Here. Thanks again for checking out another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homies Perspective podcast. Please check us out on our website at intrinsicmotivation.life where you can click on the speak pipe button and leave any suggestions for a future podcast that you'd like us to cover. 
Also check us out on our social media sites. We have a YouTube channel, Facebook page, iTunes podcast, in addition to Stitcher and Google Play, all under intrinsic motivation from a homie's perspective. Check you out next time. Have a great day.